Now, a general principle which may explain all of this stuff uh, is the uh, metric of entropy or the measure of order or disorder. So the idea I want to submit is that on this kind of um, dimension of entropy, this, this sort of dimension of order, essentially, there's a kind of sweet spot. So uh, these are ideas that are talked, to, talked about a lot at the moment in cognitive neuroscience and systems neuroscience. There's a kind of perfect place. Uh, there's a perfect balance between kind of formlessness or complete disorder and complete uh, stability but so stability to the extent or order to the extent that the system then becomes inflexible. So for consciousness to be poised in this kind of optimal place where we can scrutinize the world in the best way, uh, learn the, uh, you know, the nature of the world uh, um, in the most optimal way and yet retain flexibility given that the world is changeable, then there's a kind of sweet spot where the system has to be, where it's perfectly balanced between disorder and order. And so this would be normal waking consciousness. So I'm sure you probably all guessed where the psychedelic state might be on this trajectory, and it's over to the left. Uh, so some states which share a phenomenology with a psychedelic state, which probably also show uh, this um, sort of increase in, in disorder in the parameters that define uh, uh, the activity which underlies the states. REM sleep dreaming, early psychosis, the sensory deprived state, deep meditatory states such as this non-dual awareness, the near-death experience and the psychedelic state. So states which may kind of veer to the right and become too stable, too rigid, so that the kind of flexible quality of consciousness is lost would be seizure for instance. So people tend to think that as a, think of that as a chaotic state, but that's misleading, it's not chaotic. There's very synchronous activity in the brain in seizure, so it is a too organized state. There's too much order to such an extent that there's no flexibility and one loses consciousness. Sedation, again, a very highly synchronous state, deep sleep, and depression is probably over on this side as well, a too fixed, a too ordered state. So this should give you a feel for uh, kind of what, uh, how brain activity maps onto different conscious states. So, so just to finish up, it's this idea of, this is a whole other book, this guy Modell, talks about imagination and the meaningful brain. So it's a kind of an intense book, but I, I thought it was very interesting. And he's talking about this limbic system and what happens to us in our minds. And he's, you know, the, what I relate to what he said to what they're talking about, about ego dominance and things like that, is you freeze your metaphors. You know, you freeze your, your art, your creativity, because that's where the reimagination, that's the recontextualization, that's where the new possibilities come from. And if that system is stuck, you know, there's wrenches in the gears, then you're unable to do that. So he talks about metaphors as just being like, it's part, it's one of the main functions of our brain is to relate different domains. He calls that a metaphor. So relating the domain of my thoughts to my feelings, for example, that's one of the functions of the brain. He says that's a metaphor. And if that's broken, if that's not working right, you know, there's other metaphors of like relating the smell to this thought, you know, I mean, all these ideas, you can imagine that's what our brain's doing is connecting different domains. And if that's broken down and it's that metaphorical system that creates just like art, you know, just like this poetry and things like that, this new story, this new understanding. And so he says that, you know, this metaphorical system mostly operates subconsciously. And he uses these examples in his book of all these famous mathematicians and physicists that like when they wanted to solve some problem, the key is they think about, okay, I'm gonna solve that problem. And then next step, stop thinking about it and let it percolate. Get the mind out of the way, let the subconscious metaphorical, perhaps it's limbic, let that system work on it. And then spontaneously it will start, you know, and that's what they talk about with this entropic brain function. You get into these other stages of possibilities where the like avalanches of networks start happening. You know, things start coming together in ways that your mind can't keep up with but that we're actually designed to, to do those things. All right, go ahead. So does any of this have anything to do with being in the flow? Can I say yes. I mean, I, I say that's, where is it? So the flow is like, you know, one example, I don't know if this is just a theory, but you know, this idea, they're saying that, you know, your mind and stuff is keeping you kind of like in this more control to be able to get along and all this stuff. But when you go more open-minded consciousness, which they're saying is more entropic, more similar to the what nature's doing and like just more free and then you're in the flow more you know uh -huh. in other words the mind gets out of the way 
and then now you're the way that what seems like a chaotic, you know, their first thought is, oh my God, don't go there. You're going to get paranoid. You're going to get, who knows what's going to happen. All these crazy ideas are going to come up. But then it's like, well, what if you come into the flow there? And that's what I'm saying. In the higher self, you can come into the flow and you can be, you know, very comfortable in such a place. I, uh, I heard your talk on um, Amber Lyons' podcast. Oh, thank you. So yeah. Really enjoyed you that. So I have a question about um, the default mode net no default mode network. Yeah. Is I've thought of that as like um is it the same as like a massive like filtering mechanism? Is there a difference? Between I think it, it's related to that. That's how I think about it. Like I'm thinking about like because you know there's this because uh, you you see all the sensory inputs going through it. It seems like you know. So it seems like a filter, and then you talk about like subliminal and liminal. In other words, like your mind's just even your vision. You know, you're constantly like, filling in all these gaps. So it's like, where do you fill in the gaps, and what story are you? How are you adjusting what you're seeing? You know, and so it does seem that it is kind of like the filter. And so ideally, like you know, I think in like the shamanic like tradition, is you want like the energy to flow from your heart like through your mind. So ideally, the filter would be like a crystalline structure that would just be, you know, mm -hmm. in the flow. But, you know, if it's not, then, yeah, you're going to be blocked all these different ways. So I think it's kind of like that. That's how I think about it, too. It also shows the influence of architecture. Here you have a sort of modular architecture in A, where you have a set of elements which are interconnected, but in a certain way. It turns out this breaks down into individual little consciousnesses, very, very minimal ones with two concepts each, but there is no larger entity at all. So you don't have one big consciousness, you have a lot of small ones. In the middle you have another interesting system, five elements, all to all connectivity, majority rule, if more than three fire, I fire. And in that case, the system is one complex, it forms one entity, but it has only five concepts, and they're all elementary concepts, the ones specified by each individual element. And by the way, they're all the same. So there's only one star, if you wish, in the past and in the future. It's a totally trivial system with a minimum value of big five. So it's minimally conscious, only conscious of one little thing, this and not this. On the right is a system with five elements, same logic, but only three connections per element, and they are different from each individual element. So we have introduced some differentiation. It's not homogeneous like before. Now suddenly it is still one entity, so it's a complex, but bit phi is much higher, it's 10.75, and it has 30 different concepts of elementary and higher order. So now it is like something to be that system, and it's something more interesting than before, it breaks many symmetries. So we assume this is sort of true for many systems if you could analyze them properly. Another obvious consequence is that the consciousness can be graded. You can see here by changing the strength of the connections, which can happen in our brain, uh, from high to medium to very low, you can have one entity with high consciousness, so to speak, another one with much less so, but still one entity, and then it breaks down into sub-entities. We think that happens when you go into sleep, as I'll show you. A rather counterintuitive consequence is that a system made of inactive elements that supposedly do nothing, okay, these are copy gates that just do nothing at all, they are all off, these could be neurons that are off, will still generate consciousness of a certain kind. So you don't need to pass messages around or signal. It's an intrinsic property of something that is and has that ability for constraining the past and the future. Another consequence, you can have a very simple system, like a photo diode with memory there, which can actually generate a minimum amount of consciousness. That's actually the smallest amount. We call it really minimally conscious. It is like something to be that photo diode, although it's so trivially low that it doesn't even make much of a difference to talk about it. But it is a minimal distinction. It's this rather than not this. It doesn't matter whether you have a photodiode, a blue detector, or a thermistor. In that case, intrinsically, it just feels like just a little bit and nothing more. An interesting consequence is that the purely fit-forward system disaggregate, disintegrate. It's not a system, according to this theory, so that, in fact, if you take even a very complicated fit-forward system, there is nothing it is like to be that. You can show this because recursively nothing can act back on itself, and therefore there is nothing there. We can use it, but it doesn't feel like anything. And a key consequence of that is that you can build two systems, uh, one on the left, which is recurrent, and one on the right, which is the equivalent, purely feed-forward version of that recurrent system, which have exactly the same input-output function here up to a t equal 4. So they do exactly the same job. You could treat them. They behave equivalently for any question and answers you want to get from them. And yet, if you do the analysis according to IIT, the one on the left feels like something, is something, exists. 
The one on the right, we can use it, but it doesn't exist at all in and of itself. So there is functional equivalence without conscious equivalence. That Integrated information theory can sort of extrapolate to these uh, cases that are much more um, ambiguous based on the, uh, on the circuit complexity in the cause effect repertoire. But the one that I, that I wanted to mention is this remarkable uh, prediction of, uh, of integrated information theory that says, although you can get systems that are equivalent to within a certain time step in terms of their I.O. behavior, which is typically how we assess, of course, in the Turing test. But a Turing test is all about input-output behavior. So here you have two systems on the left and on the right, the ones that Julie showed before, that have the same I.O. behavior. Um, yet one, they have very different circuitry. So one, one has this heavy feedback circuitry, the other one is a purely feedforward system. The theory says quite unambiguously that the system on the right has no phi, it doesn't, um, the system is, is reducible to its component, it doesn't exist uh, in this sense, but of course it can act, it can, for example, process information, it can detect faces. Um, a lot of the standard machine vision algorithms, for example, the Google, the Google cat detector are of this ilk on the right. They are a series of cascaded feedforward systems these deep, um, these deep learning networks are nothing but a set of standard neural networks that are cascaded one after the other. So the theory would say, that although these systems do perform useful computational function, i.e. they find faces and cats, they don't have, it doesn't feel like anything to be them. Uh, which is really quite, so, so here the, the, the theory really differs very much from the standard way of viewing. It's not about the input-output behavior, it's about the internal circuitry, the internal cause-effect repertoire. So there are a number of systems um, uh, that, that do not have sentience, that do not have conscious. On the one hand, IT says many, many systems uh, that have complex integration going on, including possible um, or multicellular organisms or possible or biological organisms or even beyond that, may have, may have a phi different from zero. It feels like something to be the system. It's not standard uh, panpsychism, right? Standard panpsychism uh, pan -psychism claims that everything is ensouled, everything has consciousness. A dumb system, a system that has no states, for example, is not conscious, like, you know, if you want to think about a grain of sand. An aggregate of, of systems, if I just take a bunch of individual systems, so for example, here, if we, if we consider the, the consciousness associated with, with this meeting, it is not, the, there isn't any meta-consciousness, it's just the, con the consciousness of aggregate, it's just the consciousness of the individual components. Unless the, the degree of interaction is so high that it extends the, the, the integration within my brain and then you can have a, a meta-conscious, you can have this higher über-consciousness, the theory would then also predict that the individual consciousness would immediately become extinguished. Um, so as I said, feed-forward computational systems are not, uh, are not conscious. And there's a very interesting case of computer simulation. So we, uh, the field is setting out to model, or has done over the last 20 years, does very large-scale modeling. There's now a human brain project in, in Europe that has the, the goal over the next years to try to model a human brain. In the limit, once this becomes possible, let's say in 50 or 100 years, we can ask, will this, if, assuming that this entity, this, this perfect human brain model, can simulate the I.O. Of, uh, of the brain. Most people would say, well, if it, fun if it simulates all the causal elements of a brain, then of course it's conscious. But the case is much more difficult, as you saw in this, uh, in this previous case. It really depends on the underlying circuitry. Now, in particular, on digital machines, of course, ultimately, they can all be reduced to Turing machines, right? So you have this one-dimensional Turing machine, although it may be a very, very big one for the human brain simulation. So you really have to ask the, 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 um, the phi associated with the simulation is not the phi of, uh, at this meta level, but actually would be the phi of the, uh, of the Turing machine and ultimately the phi of, underlying, uh, of the underlying hardware. And that may be, that may be zero, it may be very small. So, so the, 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 the relationship between consciousness and what's being simulated here is very complex and may be very different than most uh, philosophers or people who think about these uh, imagine. And then lastly, of course, I just wanted to leave you with this, my last slide. This is the most complex artifact people have ever built. It has on the order of 10 to the 18 components, and I'd like to, uh, transistors, right? This is uh, one depiction of the internet. And um, if you just count the transistors in this internet, it has 10,000 times more transistors than synapses in the average human brain. So this, it is complex by any, by any measure of, of complexity. We don't know at this point whether it has any phi, but I think it's an interesting question. At least it's a question that we can now at least have a meaningful way to reason about. It's not a crazy question. To what extent does it feel like anything to be such an entity? Thank you very much.